Welcome everyone. Today is our last uh, higher learning seminar this semester. And uh, our first speaker is Dr. Ferreza Alza and he's originally from Australia. And uh, he has, he's a postdoc at the Black Hole Initiative since last year. And he has been working on the intersection of philosophy and physics. He got his PhD in philosophy from University of Cambridge and uh, another PhD in uh, theoretical physics um, from uh, UC Santa Barbara. And uh, today he's going to talk to us about quantifying finding vision in early universe, a micro black hole that's that method. Okay. Well, uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to tell you all about work that I've been engaged in in the past academic year or so. This is work that's been done uh, in collaboration with Avi Loeb and should be uh, hopefully out on the archive at some point soon. So uh, the idea here is to think about uh, quantifying the notion of fine-tuning and doing it in a sort of generic sense, doing it in a way that we might be able to apply this quantification to various examples in the sciences without missing the possibility of talking about fine-tuning in the context of astrophysics and uh, various processes that occur in the very early universe. So after discussing this sort of quantitative way of thinking about fine-tuning, I'll apply it to a particular example, namely a proposal that you may have heard about that claims that uh, primordial black holes make up a significant fraction of, if not all, of dark matter. Okay, so what I thought I might do uh, this is something a little different, is just at the beginning outline uh, some of the conceptual or philosophical problems that underlie the idea of fine-tuning. So set the stage a little bit before I launch into some of the details and tell you about um, how things work in our particular construction. So I think fine-tuning is uh, most striking when we think about it in the context of our own existence, right? So the fine-tuning of our existence, as encoded in our best physical theories, like the standard model of particle physics and cosmology, is a striking putative fact. You can phrase that particular statement in an even more colloquial sense, uh, highlighted in blue there, namely, if circumstances were a little different, we would not exist. So every term in that particular sentence is, uh, I think, a little bit controversial, some more uh, than others. What we do know, what we have a handle on, is the notion of precisely which circumstances we're talking about. When we're talking about circumstances, we really have in mind some sort of theory. Right? We have in mind uh, a theory as consisting of a conjunction of three items which I've listed there, namely laws, that is equations of evolution for variables that we think are important. So dynamical variables which, you've, which we've identified as being useful in terms of describing the system that we're interested in describing, together with initial conditions for those particular variables, and also unspecified dimensionless, typically parameters that uh, go into the theory that aren't specified by the theory that we need to fix by going and performing measurements uh, and then fixing to complete our description of the theory. So that stuff I think is fairly well understood. I think what is tricky is this notion of quantifying what we mean by a little bit different, making a little bit different, quote unquote, precise. This is the sort of technical challenge in the context of fine tuning. I'm not going to talk about the general uh, solution here. I don't think there is a general solution. I think it's an open, hard, difficult problem. But uh, I'll focus on a sort of subset uh, of the problem and try and hopefully make some um, sensible statements along those lines. So the other thing I want to point out, I think, is an interesting um, conceptual point of view. This is a point that's made by a philosopher by the name of Tim Maudlin, who's a philosopher of physics, and I want to sort of report on this particular idea to you. The, que the question arises when we think about what we mean by we would not exist, right? Precisely what are we referring to when we talk about our existence? So uh, another way to put this is the non-existence of what is actually going to be surprising if that thing vanishes as a result of me changing the parameters of the standard model in some sense, right? So, so from one point of view, you can pass this in the following way, that every single person in the audience right now, every one of you is an exceptionally finely tuned situation, right? Things had to be set very specifically for you to arise. But I think even you would not contend that I would then, as a result of noticing that, go ahead and try and change the standard model of particle physics to make me more li likely. Right? This is not something that you would contend. You're sort of very specific. You're perhaps too specific. 
So a way to phrase the question is, what's the most general feature of the universe or of our description, of our existence, of us, such that if that generic feature were to vanish, we would be surprised? And also such that everything that's more specific than that generic feature is somehow an accident and doesn't require a description, doesn't require, sorry, doesn't require an explanation. So what is that? It could be complexity. It could be life, as an example. And then you have to make that precise. And it's not clear what the thing is or how to make it precise. So these are all questions and answers at some level. So fine-tuning is also... Um, can also arise in the context of not just our existence, right? Anytime we notice a theory is finely tuned for some phenomenon, uh, that causes us, that, you know, our attention tends to turn to that particular idea. We notice this fact. And the question that uh, goes along with this is, is whether, is what we should do in this situation, what we should do when we notice that a theory is finely tuned for some phenomenon, which may or may not be life. And I think a contention that is not particularly controversial is that finely tuned theories tend to be a spur to theory development. Finely tuned theories tend to cry out for an explanation. And there are a variety of interesting examples in physics uh, of new, less finely tuned theories coming along and supplanting uh, more finely tuned theories. One example is that of, of cosmic inflation supplanting the standard Big Bang model of cosmology. And then you can worry about whether inflation itself, whether the new theory itself is finely tuned or too finely tuned as well. And there was this debate that arose uh, recently in the literature with sort of people arguing on both sides of uh, the question of whether cosmic inflation is in fact finely tuned. I'm not going to deal with that here, but I want to sort of put it forward as an example of, um, of theory development with fine tuning in mind. So um, let me also make one other point that those in the vanguard of of, of theory development in emerging disciplines, so those people who are working on developing sort of new areas of theoretical physics, as it were, like theoretical biophysics and theoretical neuroscience, are indeed sensitive to this tradition. They have um, digested this idea and it's, it's in their minds when they're thinking about writing down new theories. So Bill Bialik here, uh, who's uh, one of the distinguished voices in biophysics, says the following, and I think this will probably uh, gel with many of you here, namely, he says the following, how can we reconcile the parameter aversion of theoretical physicists with the explosion of parameters that arise in a realistic approach to biological systems? Much of what our community, by which he means those people who are interested in thinking about life from a quantitative point of view, much of what our community is doing, I think, can be understood as a reaction to this problem. Then he goes on to say, one possibility, surely, is that the multitude of parameters is a fact of life, is somehow irreducible, in which case we need to give up on our search for a physicist's understanding. I'll discard this as too pessimistic, says Bill. I will also discard this as too pessimistic, and I would contend that many of you would possibly discard this as being too pessimistic too. All right, so, um, so with that sort of conceptual framework in mind, let me tell you what it is that, um, that I want to talk about in this talk, or at least the sort of technical part of the talk. So in, uh, what we did was we focused on developing quantitative measures of fine tuning, uh, which can be applied to various models in astrophysics. Uh, that we think could be used to sort of compare theories and models against one another to make a statement about which theory uh, you may want to favor. So we have the idea, we have the sort of concept of theory development in mind, want to quantify it and apply it in various circumstances. So I think there are two notions of fine-tuning that one needs to uh, talk about uh, to do this. Namely, one needs to uh, describe a local measure of fine-tuning together with a global measure of fine-tuning. And after describing both of these two uh, measures, I will then characterize, as I said, fine-tuning in models which, which purport that a significant fraction of the dark matter of our universe is in the form of primordial black holes. Okay, so here's the local measure um, of fine-tuning. It's set in a very sort of generic context. So the idea is the following, that you have some set of observables O, which act on some set of parameters P and map them into right, some set of observables. O1, O2, up through, through to OM. And this particular mapping is very generic, right? It can go from some initial set of parameters via some dynamical system to the end state of the dynamical system, which can then get mapped via some algebraic relation onto things that we might see. So you could go from so parameters of inflation to things like the amplitude for density perturbations or the cosmological constant, from which you can then extract something like the number of Milky Way type galaxies in our universe. All of this is sort of encoded, is embedded, um, is contained within this kind of um, mapping. 
So then you can de define the local sensitivity of O sub mu, the sort of muth observable, at some point p primed, right, at the parameter value that uh, you need to fix to make your theory consistent with uh, your observations, you could look for the local sensitivity in some direction epsilon, in some direction in parameter space. And the way we've defined it um, is simply as, um, as a sort of dimensionless uh, fractional change in O sub mu. So it's the sort of change in the observable, essentially, um, as a function of sort of done in such a way that you end up with a dimensionless fraction. So uh, if you trace through the analysis, you end up with um, a term which looks something like this, and this sort of muth um, uh, measure of local fine-tuning, as it were, is really just the projection of the gradient of O in the direction that you're interested in. It's sort of DO over O um, over DP by P. So it's the derivative of the logarithm of the muth observable with respect to the logarithm of the parameter. And so then you can take all these different uh, measures and, and push, pull them all together in a single general measure of the local amount of fine tuning in the way that I've described. This is a simple way to do it. It's one way to do it. Uh, and you end up with the sort of expression that you see on your right hand side on the top there. So for a single observable when m equals 1, which is the situation that I'll be interested in here, so I'm interested in an observable, and the, observable, the observables I'll be talking about will, will connect to um, essentially the fraction of dark matter that's in the form of primordial black hole, so you can keep you know, a positive number in mind as the observable that I'm interested in. When m equals 1, um, then this particular sort of total level of fine-tuning uh, turns, to, turns out to look like this. And as I mentioned, it's a sort of derivative of the logarithm over the, uh, it's a derivative of the logarithm of the observable with respect to the logarithm of the parameter. So from that point of view, L as a number, um, L here on the left-hand side as a number, um, looks, parameterizes this sort of relationship. O looks, goes as P to the L. So when L is zero, that means you can change the parameters. That's not going to change the observables. You don't have fine-tuning. You don't have local fine-tuning in that situation. If L is 1, then, then the observable is sensitive to the parameter in a sort of linear fashion, when L is 2 in a quadratic fashion, and so on. And so then you can use that fact to delineate various orders of fine-tuning depending on the value of L that you extract. But local measures of fine-tuning aren't the full story. right? Fine-tuning is more complicated than that. So as an example, when epsilon, this direction and parameter space that you're interested in, points along a contour of the observable, then the local measure vanishes. Right? The local measure is a projection of a gradient onto a direction. When those two things are 90 degrees to each other, they're going to vanish. But that's not going to be sufficient to rule out fine-tuning, as you might sort of phenomenologically think about it. So we need what, is, uh, what I refer to as a global measure of fine-tuning. And the global measure of fine-tuning is very simple. It just computes how far you need to travel in some direction in parameter space. So it's not local. You're at some point in parameter space, and you want to know how far you need to travel to, to give rise to a significant change in the observable relative to how far you could have traveled in principle. Right? So when that distance, um, that distance is small, that, so the distance you need to travel is small, then the situation is globally finely tuned, when if you could go the entire range uh, in principle that you could have traveled in parameter space and not get a significant change in the observable, then the situation is not globally fine-tuned. And so uh, what you need to do to construct this global measure of fine-tuning is at, again, some particular point in parameter space P primed. Uh, sorry, I didn't realize I had a pointer. Um, uh, in some direction V, you find this particular quantity here you find the, the, va the, the size of the vector which leads to an order unity change in the observable. And then you can simply um, divide that ratio, divide the total distance you could have traveled in that direction starting from some point in parameter space by the size of the vector, and, and that's sort of the measure of global fine-tuning. So there's another measure. Essentially, you don't have to go in one direction. You could go in either direction. You could ask how far could it go in either direction to, to, to get an order unity change relative to how far it could have gone in principle in either direction, divide those two things, and get another measure of global fine-tuning. That's what I call G tilde. And then you can talk about orders of global fine-tuning, too. Right? If G is 0, 
then uh, there is no global fine tuning. As I described earlier, if G is, for example, one, then um, the total distance you could have traveled is 10 times the size of the vector that leads to an order unity change. You have a, a sort of some sense of global fine tuning. Okay, so um, what I want to do is then, I want to apply this to a particular situation. I, I contend that this is a situation that holds in very simplified scenarios in science, across the sciences, and I think in simplified situations in astrophysics, uh, and, and also potentially in biophysics, but I want to apply it in a, a particular scenario to show you how it might work. And the particular scenario I pick um, is that of primordial black holes in the context of dark matter. And so these, as some of you may know, were posited about 50 years ago. They're hypothetical. They haven't been necessarily discovered. Um, and they arise from overdensities in the early universe. Such overdensities can be sourced by a variety of means, including an early inflationary period. And the idea that primordial black holes could constitute dark matter uh, is an idea that's been around for a while, pretty much since the um, original postulation of these quantities, or at least for 40 years. And this kind of idea, uh, this kind of promotion of primordial black holes as dark matter, is a sort of separate way of thinking about dark matter compared to the, the particle-based models of dark matter that people put forward. This is a, a model of dark matter that sits squarely within the standard model of particle physics. And it's an alternative to those particle-based characterizations of dark matter. Right, so if I want to describe fine-tuning in this particular context, I need to tell you what the parameters are, right? The, the, the manner in which I parameterize how primordial black holes could be dark matter. And for the sake of simplicity, I invoke a general functional form for the mass function of primordial black holes, which is this general functional form is thought to be a good approximation, that you would end up getting um, this kind of differential mass fraction, F sub M, in various scenarios which give rise to primordial black holes, various, say, cosmic inflation scenarios which give rise to primordial black holes. So F of M is, the, as I said, the differential mass fraction um, of, uh, of so primordial black holes compared to all of dark, compared to dark matter, or the sort of density of dark matter, and it's given by this log normal form. So F sub PBH is the integral of this quantity over, um, over uh, so it's the integral of F of M over log M, it's a function of log M, uh, and when you do that integral, you, you find that this fraction, this total fraction that I'll be referring to of dark matter in the form of primordial black holes is a density ratio. It's omega primordial black hole of omega dark matter. So that's what I mean by the fraction. So you end up with a two-parameter, right? So, so we need to know what those parameters are in the context of fine-tuning, a two-parameter log normal extended mass function, and there are a variety of constraints on the total fraction of dark matter that's in the form of primordial black holes. So these sorts of uh, mass functions are subject to observational constraints. That's my point. And here is an example of some illustrative monochromatic constraints. So what I've plotted on the y-axis is the fraction, so the log, log of the fraction of um, dark matter in the form of primordial black holes. On the x-axis, I have the mass of the primordial black holes. And there are various constraints that come from considerations of primordial black hole evaporation, the fact that you don't see lensing at the rates that you might expect to see, uh, together with other dynamical effects and also primordial black hole accretion and radiation, which would affect things like the CMB in, in ways that we don't notice. So that sort of sets a upper limit, as it were, uh, on the total amount of um, dark matter that can be in the form of primordial black holes. And this blue line, um, sorry, this blue line here corresponds to the maximal fraction. These are evolving. Um, so I've taken some set of constraints from this particular paper, uh, and uh, there are updates on this, but I'm using this really for illustrative purposes to show you how this all works. So, there are, so that, that, this particular plot comes from considering um, primordial black holes as being monochromatic, so all having sort of a single mass, whereas I'm talking about an extended mass function, and there are procedures which have been developed that convert uh, these constraints on um, an extended mass function, assuming that they were derived from monochromatic considerations. And so um, you can find them in, in these papers if you're interested, but the constraints are essentially the following, that the extended mass function, which is F sub M, divided by the maximum value of the fraction of dark matter in the form of primordial black holes, assuming a monochromatic mass function, which is where all the experimental constraints come from, that ratio has to be less than or equal to one. If you take that as a given and you assume that your extended mass function has this log normal form, then you end up and you end up with an inequality on FPBH. Right? So if you substitute this equation 
into this inequality, you end up with an inequality for FPBH. And if you take the maximal value, if you saturate that inequality, you end up with a, uh, an estimate of the maximal possible fraction of dark matter that can be in the form of primordial black holes. Right? So, you, so assuming the extended mass function, assuming the illustrative monochromatic constraints that I've uh, suggested uh, in the last slide, you end up with this sort of maximal fraction, a two-parameter maximal fraction of dark matter in the form of primordial black holes. So this, this particular fraction depends on mc and sigma, and so if you perform that integral numerically, which is what I've done here, you end up with this particular plot. So this particular plot on the x-axis is the sort of, is mc the central um, mass value of the extended mass function as a function of uh, sigma, namely the width of the extended mass function, and this is a contour plot of the maximal fraction of um, dark matter that can be in the form of primordial black holes. What you will notice is this little region here uh, where you can get a very high maximal fraction, that it's allowed that these sorts of constraints, can, together with the extended mass function that I set down, allows for a significant fraction, right, 0.8 or 0.7, yeah, to be in the form of prim, uh, in the form of primordial black holes. So if you zoom in on this particular region here, then you end up with this plot, simply. Uh, the same plot, but looking at a sort of subset of the original one, uh, and, I've, and then what you're interested in is characterizing local and global degrees of fine-tuning. So what you need to do is you need to pick a particular parameter, a particular point in parameter space. So I've chosen this red dot here as an example of a point in this parameter space which gives rise to a, a significant fraction of dark matter in the form of primordial black holes, i.e. 0.79. Right? This is just a point that I've chosen. We don't have this experimental um, value. This is just sort of an estimate. It's a probe of a particular paradigm, if you will. So uh, then to compute this local um, a level of fine-tuning, um, this L1, which is inside these absolute values, depends on the particular parameter and the vector that you're interested in. So this direction can be parameterized by theta. It's sort of a, an angle in a plane. And as theta goes from 0, or 0 points in this direction, all the way to 2 pi, you get various degrees of local fine-tuning. And what you notice is the maximal local fine-tuning is of order 25. Is that large or not, right? That's a question that one can worry about. If you think about the local fine-tuning is telling you how the observable depends on the parameter, where O looks like P to the L, uh, what you're saying here is the maximal amount of fine-tuning locally looks, uh, corresponds to something like O is P to the 25. And so from you know, an absolute point of view, you could think of that as being large. The sort of conceptual point is that there's a really a comparison going here. Uh, comparison going on here, that you would compare that particular value to the value that you might get from another kind of scheme. And then you can do the same sort of thing with the global level um, of fine-tuning. So remember, you, in, the global in the global description of fine-tuning, what you're interested in is how far you uh, need to travel to lead to an order unity change in the observable. The observable here is the fraction, the, ma the maximal fraction. So in this case, I've zoomed out a little bit, and the blue region corresponds to the region which gives rise to an order unity change. Uh, and so what you're comparing in this sort of G tilde, where you're looking at sort of both directions simultaneously in the global case for theta equals zero, for example, you're comparing this distance here uh, to the total distance you could possibly have traveled. And so I need to set bounds on those distances, compare those two distances against each other, take the logarithm, and I end up with a plot which looks like this. The point from this plot is that all sort of angles from naught to pi are sort of globally fine-tuned to at least some order um, in this description. Okay, so that's basically what I wanted to tell you about. So um, let me summarize quickly. I've defined local and global measures of fine-tuning, which, which I think are suited to, you know, as you could sort of tell, particular situations. Um, I think they apply sort of generally. Um, I think they apply in certain astrophysical situations. I think, as I mentioned, they might apply in various biophysical situations too. And then I use this to characterize fine-tuning in models that claim that a significant fraction of dark matter is in the form of primordial black holes. Uh, these situations, I think, are finely tuned in both a local and a global sense. Uh, and I think this level of fine-tuning would increase substantially if you weren't to just sort of insert yourself at the, in the analysis at the level of the extended mass function, but you were to sort of consider these scenarios from the point of view of inflation, for, for example, and ask about um, the parameters that parameterize cosmic inflation and how they sort of uh, evolve into this, uh, into this extended mass function. So I think 
considering parameters from that point of view would possibly lead to um, an increase in the level of fine tuning. Okay, so I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Right, so I think this is an interesting sort of issue. I mean, how to make sense of, so how to make sense of these measures in a sort of broader context um, is a little bit open, I would say. So there's a sort of absolute sense in which you could refer to this number. So as I mentioned, you know, you may say p to the 25 is much worse than p to the 10. Um, at the very least, you want, if you're comparing sort of two scenarios, I would say you want a lack of global fine tuning and you want a lack of, or you would, sorry, I'll phrase that differently. You want less global fine tuning and less local fine tuning um, relative to some other theory. But, but let me also point out the sort of conceptual issue that it's not just fine tuning or a lack of fine tuning that goes into theory development. I've sort of highlighted one aspect. There are sort of other what philosophers call theoretical virtues of theories, which you possibly advert to in your thinking about theories. Um, but which are hard to make precise. Like, for example, you want your theory to be internally consistent. You don't want sort of mathematical inconsistencies internally, contradictions. You want external consistency. You want to be able to take your theory and embed it into some other sort of set of theories in a way which doesn't cause obvious contradictions. You want so sort of empirical adequacy, obviously. You want something people refer to as fertility, i.e. The, the theory provides you with other questions that are interesting, sort of research. So, so there is a, um, a set of considerations, right? And, and, it's, and I, don't want to, I don't want to suggest that, that this, is the only, this is the only consideration. You should consider all of these things together. And there's, I mean, there's a sense in which there's a bit of an art form here, right? You sort of go by intuition together with some external markers, and you make a statement about whether this theory is better or worse than this other theory as a result of this level of fine tuning. Um, what is the mass range of the primordial black hole? So the mass range that I chose, um, I'll show you. So, so there's a, these are the constraints. These are the experimental constraints. Um, and these constraints have been updated. And there are essentially three regions where you can get a significant fraction of um, uh, dark matter as being primordial black holes. Very sublunar. So, so somewhere around here in this plot. And then also somewhere around the sort of LIGO-Virgo range. So um, 10, orders of 10 solar masses. Now, if you're also wondering how it is that I chose these particular values, i.e., what was the, how did you come up with the range that you're interested in? Well, this particular value, so primordial black holes that were formed that were roughly 10 to the 15 grams in the early universe would be evaporating today. So anything smaller than this you wouldn't see because it would have evaporated already. This particular range is sort of illustrative, and it comes from, I mean, I could sort of tell you about it later, but this maximal mass comes from a particular um, scheme that gives, the, a particular formation scheme that gives rise to primordial black holes, which allows you to set down a number such as 10 to the 4 solar masses. But uh, I think this is variable. I think it's model dependent, and I've chosen it as purely illustrative.
Okay, um, so thank you very much uh, for the introduction and also uh, for giving me the opportunity to talk about my research here. So I'll be focusing today on really what we learned on the formation and evolution of bulges and disks in high redshift galaxies. And so particularly I'm interested to look at um, images such as this one here. So this is a Hubble Space Telescope image in the H-band, so red frame, you know, it's, it's at 1.6 micron. And, and so you can see here many dots, it's, you know, not, it's been maybe a bit hard to see, but some of these galaxies are actually lying at redshift of about two. So, you know, the redshift that I'm particularly interested. So this light has been traveling for about 10 billion years to us. And now with the Hubble Space Telescope, we can make quite exquisite images of these, image, um, of these galaxies. You can see here, uh, you know, a color composite of the B, I, and H band image. So this corresponds rest frame for, to far UV, near UV, and the optical light. And so you can see that there's a lot of structure we can see. And so my main frame of the talk will be about space resolving these structures and trying to understand, you know, what kind of physical mechanisms um, are kind of taking place in such galaxies. Now, but let's first um, maybe go, um, you know, one step closer to us. So this is a local um, small group. This is uh, the Draco group. It's about 100 million light years away from us. And when you look at the, you know, at just this image, you see already there's such a large diversity of galaxies. And so you can see here um, something that, you know, is a bit more yellowish, a spheroid-like, and here's something that's a disk-like. And so when you see something like this, you immediately ask kind of questions, you know, what kind of physical mechanisms are responsible for really the radial assembly of solar mass in such structures? Why are they so different? And then, of course, also here you see something that forms really no stars, whereas here we have still an actively star-forming object. And so you ask maybe the question is, you know, what brings the star formation in the galaxy to a halt? And so these are the two main questions I'm kind of going um, through my talk. And so, you know, when you look at the structure, you can see that here, you know, we have in both galaxies a spheroidal component, so, you know, a dynamically hot component in the core. So this is kind of, you know, spheroid is kind of making up the whole elliptical galaxy here, whereas here it's just really the central part, the bulge, and then we have a disk that forms the stars. And because you see, you know, this, not just in this image, but in general in the galaxy population, that there is, you know, a quite tight link between the structural properties of galaxies as, well as their colors, maybe the same processes are at work, you know, that kind of stops the, the star formation in galaxies as well as making it um, looking as spheroidal like So when we go a bit more statistically into the galaxy population, this is a recent compilation uh, from Moffat et al. that looks really into the, the, the mass fraction and stellar mass into the disk components and as spheroid components. And you can see that when you go to higher and higher mass galaxies, more and more galaxies are spheroidal-like. Now, in a very simple picture, you know, that we know for, for many, many years now, is that a spheroid can be made uh, dissipationless by just, you know, merging kind of stars onto a larger system. So there is no really gas involved. It's just really star-star mergers. You can think of dry mergers adding to an elliptical galaxy. On the other hand, um, disks, um, they arise from really the collapse of you know, high momentum gas that forms in a disk, and in this gas, and you can form stars. Now, in particular, when you think about spheroids, you know, the physics, um, uh, you know, we learned in the last few years much more about it. And there have been many, you know, from theoretical grounds, many propositions of how one, um, what kind of processes can lead to a spheroidal or bulge like component in galaxies. And so one thing is when you think of, you know, um, when we look at just at these galaxies in the York universe, how do you make kind of a spheroidal like object? Um, it has been just suggested that you can just take, for example, spiral galaxies and merge them together. And then because, um, you know, the gas that will be fueled to the center in such an event, you will have a starburst in the central part of this, this new formed galaxy. And so we will form a, um, a spheroidal-like component there. So this is mainly major mergers in the local, um, in the local universe. There is also, you know, based on simulations, um, kind of high zoom-in simulations, seen that when you have pu pu um, poorly aligned accretion events, when you have gas accretion once, you know, in one direction and then a gas accretion in the other direction, you can also build up a spheroidal-like component. And then another thing that came up recently is a clump migration as well as disk instability. So in high redshift galaxies, we believe that these galaxies are very gas-rich, so they have gas fractions of the order of 50%. In such galaxies, um, you can have disk instabilities that drive a lot of gas into the central part, as well as clumps, star-forming clumps that are of the order of sizes of a kiloparsec that are migrating into the central part and can contribute to the bulge growth. And so we have many uh, theoretical ideas, but why is it so difficult to kind of go to observations and just pin down and say, yes, it is mainly this 
um, you know, kind of mechanism. And there are, of course, um, you know, two obvious answers. One of them is that galaxies evolve over very long time scales, so we cannot just look at one individual galaxy and then just, you know, see, ah, oh, this is what is happening, but we have to look at the population, and then it's always difficult to infer direct links um, for individual objects. And the second part is, of course, that most spheroidal components are very old, and so we need to look actually far away if you want to see their formation. And this is also shown when you look at the cosmic star formation rate density in the universe as a function of um, look-back time. You can see here that most of the stars actually formed the redshift of about two. So we have, you know, when you look at redshift 1.3, already half of the mass has already been formed, basically. And so if you want to understand, you know, where most of the stars or, you know, the spherical components have formed, we need to go to really these high redshifts. And this is why I'm focusing now basically on, on redshift of two. So the talk um, is structured, you know, first I start out with some numerical work that we have done um, two years ago um, on, on how to form compact um, um, spheroids in the central parts of, of high redshift galaxies. And then I will be looking you know, to observations, in particular looking at spatial resolved studies on the solar mass growth as well as why these galaxies switch off their star formation. And so there is a bit of the high energy coming in when we talk about AGNs. So I will be very brief. I just want to show you um, a numerical simulation. This is a cosmological zoom-in simulation. And what you will see here is the gas density in the simulation. And so this is a zoom-in simulation, meaning that we are kind of, you know, when you reach a certain density, you kind of, you know, adaptively uh, refine your, your mesh, where, you, you know, your computation is taking place. And so what happens is that at the end, we have a resolution of about 25 parsecs in the densest regions of these galaxies. And so in such simulations, you are able to really study the gas flow in the galaxies and understand where the star formation takes place on spatially resolved scales. So we have only 26 um, such simulations, but as I said, they have quite nice resolution. We probe a solar mass of 10 to 9, 10 to 11 solar mass, so these are rather massive galaxies. And then we have an implementation for thermal radiative feedback in these simulations for solar winds and supernova, but we don't have any AGN feedback. And so when we look at these simulations, what we find is that a lot of the bulge formation process we have discussed before, they're actually, you know, taking place. And they actually place together. And so we term this, um, you know, compaction, because what we see is that these galaxies are very gas rich at early times, and they're usually rotating rather slowly. And then you have an external um, trigger, mainly, mainly external, for example, a merger, but it can also be just a counter-rotating stream. It doesn't have to be a lot. You know, you can have a little bit of gas kind of accreting into the opposite direction of, of, the, of, the, of the overall rotation of the system. And this, you know, will lower the angular momentum of the gas disk a lot so that you have you know, a lot of accretion into the central part on a very short amount of time. <coughs> and so this means that, you know, that the gas really, you know, because the star formation time scale is longer than the infold time, you will add, you know, a lot of really, you know, pure gas into the central core of these galaxies within a central kiloparsec. And so you can see this in these, you know, gas, you know, this is showing this, the stellar mass surface density, this is the gas surface stellar mass density profile. So this is the gas that you can really see that it, it peaks up, you know, by about an order of magnitude. So you're increasing the central gas density significantly. And also when you look at the star formation or the specific star formation profiles, those are increasing significantly in the central part. So you're building up a very dense spheroid um, in, 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 in such an event. And then when you, you know, wait a bit and you look at what happens after the compaction phase, you actually, because the gas, you know, that first of all, the gas gets consumed into stars, so you're building stars, so the gas disappears because of this. But also, the, the stars themselves, they have feedback, so, you know, there is supernovas going off, and so you're blowing out a lot of the gas in the central part. And so you're actually kind of ending up with a, something that has like a hole in the gas disk. And so this means that, you know, the gas surface density is lower, and therefore also the star formation rate. And when you look at the specific star formation rate profile, this is rising to the outskirts. And so, you know, your central core is then really depleted, and you're not really doubling your mass in the central core anymore. Most of the solar mass growth happens then in the outskirts. And so this kind of motivates to look into um, observations and see whether we can, you know, measure some of these profiles. And so here I, you know, present you some work that we have done in collaboration uh, with Mochella Karola at DTH Zurich, but also Natasha Fursa Schreiber um, and Reinhard Gensel at MP and Albert Rincini in Padua. And so this work is, um, is really a large effort. In particular, it includes an over 300-hour VLT Symphony Adaptive Optics program. And so here, you know, this is very clear that it's AO. So we are really um, spatially resolving the H-alpha mission line on a kiloparsec scale in these galaxies. And so these are galaxies that, you know, as, as I say, I will show you afterwards, they are star forming in a redshift of two. And we talk here of a sample of about 35 galaxies. And so this, this data here gives you the H alpha mission line. And so we cannot just do the kinematics, but we can also study the star formation rate distribution. 
Then we have also observed these galaxies with, with the Hubble Space Telescope. So this is, um, you know, one of the images I showed you at the beginning of the talk. So this is um, chain H-band imaging that really traced the rest train 4,000 Armstrong breaks. So we can get good mass to light ratio variations throughout the objects. And so we can study the, you know, the spatial resolved cellular mass density in these galaxies. And then finally, we also have um, a BNI band imaging campaign. So this is now only for 10 galaxies um, because we need a really deep BE band imaging. And so this traces the rest from UV continuum, and so we get a handle on the dust attenuation in these galaxies. And so as I said, you know, the galaxies, when you look at the star formation and stellar mass relation, you see that these galaxies probe about two orders of magnitude in stellar mass and about three orders of magnitude in, in star formation. And so you can see that they lie right roughly on the so-called star forming main sequence, but we are not, you know, claiming that we have any kind of mass complete sample or anyway anything, because the main selection driver was actually that we can do the adaptive optics, and for this we needed to have an AO guiding star close by, okay? And so we wanted to have a spectroscopic redshift and an AO guiding star close by, and you know, this about eight years ago, so the spectroscopic surveys were still rather limited and biased to the blue. And this you can see also in our, you know, when we look at the colors of these galaxies, so this is the U minus V, V minus J color, and so up here are the quiescent galaxies. Our galaxies lie all down here that are star forming. But you see that we are missing the very dusty objects. And this is really to do with the main sample selection that we were um, targeting galaxies that have a spectroscopic redshift and an AO guiding star close by. And there were just not too many dusty objects at these early times. Nowadays, we would have some more of that. But then, nevertheless, this sample is very unique. As I say, it, we have kinematics. Um, we have solar mass density, star formation rate densities, as well as dust attenuation measurements. Of, you know, of the order of one to two kiloparsec resolution in these galaxies. And so why do you want to have this kind of resolution? This is showing you one of the examples. Um, this is a galaxy at of 2.2. It has a stellar mass of about four times 10 to the 10 solar masses and a star formation of about 200 solar masses per year. So this is very typical for Redshift 2. Um, and you can see, you know, there are these kind of clumps in the outskirts of such a system. And when we look at um, Symphony Hour observations, you can see this is the flux in H alpha, and this is the velocity field, well, velocity field of H alpha. And you can see this very nice, you know, rotating pattern here, as well as the clumps in the outskirts. Now, we observed the same galaxy with KMOS, um, which is just seeing limited, and you can see here the PSF increases significantly to about, you know, five kiloparsec. And so you can see that you can still do science with that, but it's much harder to, you know, to do really the spatially resolved, um, you know, clump studies as well as star formation and distribution in the galaxies. Nevertheless, KMOS, of course, has the advantage that you can do many galaxies, so it has multiplexing, and so, you know, it's kind of a trade-off always what kind of science questions you want to ask and go for. This is showing you the compilation of all the galaxies in the, in the, you know, in the, for the kinematics. So, again, this is just highlighting you, this is the ionized gas kinematics. This is really tracing H alpha. And so we kind of ordered them by rotation dominated up here, merger down here, and dispersion dominated up there. And if you, you know, if, if, you, if you look at this, you can immediately see there is some kind of a size trend, right? If you go you know, from to the left to the right, you see suddenly galaxies getting smaller. They seem to be more dispersion dominated. And that's why I would put dispersion dominated in quotation marks, because you know, the main cause for this is probably just that we don't spatially resolve the rotation in these galaxies. They are too small, and so beam smearing is taking over, and they seem to be dispersion dominated. But actually, if you would have you know, even a higher resolution, spatial resolution, then we would be able to find um, that they are probably rotating as well. And so now, maybe the main part uh, of the talk, this is um, showing you now really the star formation rate and stellar mass distribution in these galaxies. So this is the star stellar mass surface density shown in red, and the blue shows you the star formation rate surface density for a low mass spin, so you know, between around 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 11 solar masses, and this is for galaxies you know, around and above 10 to the 11 solar masses. And so the first thing to notice is that when you look at the stellar mass surface density profiles, there's quite some diversity. Some of them have already, you know, kind of a bulge-like component in the central core, but most of them are still well described by a surface index of 1 to 2, so kind of disk-like. If you go to higher mass objects, all of them are well described by a surface index of 3, so they are clearly very similar to kind of structures of early type galaxies in the local universe. And also when you look at the central densities, you know, here we talk of several, you know, 10 to the 10 solar masses per kiloparsec squared, so these are densities that are similar to you know, the ones we measure in local early type galaxies. So this means that these galaxies have already formed their central cores. Okay? That's already in place. So you don't need to have much more star formation taking place there. When you look at the star formation rate distributions, you can see that they are disk-like in both, in both um, kind of panels, and so in both, at, at both mass spins. And so the only thing that you can see maybe as a difference is that the scale length is a bit increasing to the high mass end. When you're interested to understand like, where these galaxies are growing due to star formation, a very useful uh, way to look at this is at the specific star formation rate. So this is really just 
dividing the star formation rate surface density by the stellar mass surface density. And so you can see that it's roughly flat um, in the low mass spin. And so this indicates that you are doubling your mass in the central part as well as in the outskirts roughly hand in hand. So this, grow, you know, this growth takes place uh, kind of self-similarly. Whereas when you go to the high mass galaxies, they have a reduced specific star formation rate in their central core with respect to the outskirt by about an order of magnitude. And especially when you look at the numbers, the inverse of the specific star formation rate, so the mass doubling time scale roughly, is longer than the Hubble time. And so this indicates that these galaxies are still forming some stars, but the newly formed stars, you know, they don't really contribute anymore to the stellar mass that is already there. Okay, so you're forming stars, but the, the mass density you already have in the center is so much higher that whatever you do, basically, with this star formation, it doesn't, it doesn't really contribute anymore. And so that's why we would call that these galaxies have already started kind of their quenching phase, their switch off of star formation. In the central part, they have, you know, kind of, they have very reduced star formation activity, while most of the star formation actually takes place in the outskirts. We can see similar that, you know, when you look at the central density, this is just really measuring the stellar mass density in the center versus stellar mass. The gray points show you the redshift zero um, population, and our galaxies are here. And so, you know, this already indicates that galaxies have kind of to evolve along such a relation. So you have to build up the central density hand in hand with the, the total stellar mass. That is very consistent with our findings with the specific star formation rate profiles um, on spatially resolved scales. And also when you look at the most massive galaxies, indeed we have central densities that are comparable um, you know, to, to local galaxies. Probably there is some mass missing in the outskirts, but overall the stellar mass density is very consistent in the central core. Now, of course, a very important effect is dust. Um, I haven't really talked about this yet, so I, I do this here. And when we have star formation rate measurements, we want to understand, you know, how, how much dust contribution is there. And, and so uh, there is really where this UV imaging comes into play, where we have, you know, the far UV and near UV imaging to get a handle on the UV continuum slope, which we can use as a dust tracer. And so what we find for the dust profile, so you see the individual galaxies show, show you a lot of, you know, uh, very, you know, variation, which is very interesting. On average, the dust attenuation profiles are increasing to the central part, you know, and we have about two magnitudes of extinction in the center. But interestingly, you know, we measure, you know, quite out, you know, about 10 to the, you know, about to 10 kiloparsecs, quite, you know, out to the galaxy, outside of the galaxy, we measure still some kind of dust contribution. And this is actually consistent with other studies of Ruiz et al. as well as Hemati et al. who studies also, um, you know, dust profiles based on, um, inter you know, on, on photometry. On the other hand, when we have, there is another work by Nelson et al. who looks into the Balmain decrement uh, for, a, for a second analysis for similar mass galaxies. What they find is that, you know, that, that there is nearly uh, zero dust around three kiloparsec, and so their dust profile is really centrally peaked. And so there seems to be still a lot of, um, you know, uncertainties in the measurements as well as um, kind of things we can learn going from a dust attenuation, for example, in the continuum and compare it to nebular line emission. This is showing you just the dust correction and how, you know, how different dust corrections kind of impact um, your result. The, the key result is really that, you know, that we have that lower mass objects between 10 to 10 and 10 to 11 solar masses have specific star formation rate profiles that are roughly flat. And so these galaxies are doubling their mass every 300 million years in the center and the outskirts, whereas the more massive uh, galaxies have a reduced specific star formation rate in their core. Now, the reduced specific star formation rate, you know, that I've shown you before, it still looks kind of similar to what I showed you before in the simulations, right? In the simulations, I also showed you that the galaxies in the post-compaction phase have a reduced specific star formation rate in their cores. And so what I do here is I just can plot this, this, the surface density profiles from the simulations, um, you know, versus the ones from observations. And so this is showing you the observations in the three mass spins, you know, at these redshifts. And so what I'm doing now is just taking the simulations, basically, take the same uh, redshift range and mass ranges and plot them on the top. And so, you know, of course, because we choose the same mass range, it's not too surprising that we find good agreement in, this, in, this, in the stellar mass surface density profiles. But what is really astonishing is the good agreement in the star formation rate profiles, as well as the specific star formation rate profiles. And so this indicates that these simulations, you know, pick up at least the shapes of the star formation rate profiles um, rather well. Now, the overall normalization, as you see here, is, is quite different. And so this is kind of what we measure originally in the simulations. And when we just renormalize the simulations by a constant factor, we find, you know, the very good agreement. And so it seems that there is a big, you know, disagreement on really the absolute number of star formation in measuring observations versus the one in simulations. Now, the question is, where are all these galaxies in the compaction phase? And as I told you before, these are, might not be in our observations. 
In our observations, we are just tracing kind of the blue part of this galaxy population, whereas the galaxies that have this kind of, you know, very strong inflow of gas into the central core and this high star formation in the central core, these galaxies are expected to be very dusty. And so you can see this here, for example. This is a and a CJH image of, of a galaxy. This looks very red. And this is not just because, you know, it's not because it's not star forming. This galaxy has a star formation of several hundred solar masses per year, but it's red because of all the dust. And so these galaxies, you know, it seems, you know, when we want to find galaxies that are going through a compaction event, we need to go to, um, we need to go to surveys that look at infrared bright sources. And so, you know, there have been several studies looking into this. I'll show you here results from Barre et al. as well as Hadaki et al which really compare the size of the H-band image to the one in the in ALMA measurements. And so you can see here, this is the H-band image. It's quite an extended source. Whereas when you look at the ALMA, it, this is just here shown as, as black. The contours are showing you the H-band. You can see there's a very clear, you know, strong size difference. And this you can see also here, this is the kind of the, the half light size. You can see that the ALMA sources are always smaller than the ones, you know, in the H-band. And this just shows you that, you know, that you have a lot of kind of infrared and dust emission in the central core of these galaxies. And so most probably these are galaxies that are going through such a compaction event. So looking a bit more into the transition phase to quiescent galaxies. Um, so because we measure the star formation and the star formation and mass profiles, an interesting question is, you know, when do these galaxies stop forming their stars completely? And so because these galaxies are already very massive, they are of the order of 10 to the 11 solar masses, they cannot keep forming stars much longer. Because, you know, when you think about the mass functions, there are very few galaxies that have 10 to the 12 solar masses in the local universe. And so if all these galaxies will keep forming stars, they will be more than 10 to the 12 solar mass. So we need to, sh you know, sh shut down their star formation rather soon. We can do a very similar argument on spatially resolved scales. And so, you know, a typical massive early type galaxy of about four times 10 to 11 solar masses in the local universe has a profile in solar mass that looks something like this. And so this is what we measure at redshift two for our galaxies. And you can see, we can still kind of increase the solar mass density, but we cannot do this for a too long time scale. And so we can just integrate the star formation at surface density we measured and add it to the solar mass density and see, you know, when we need to switch off the star formation. And so this, Yes, interesting, yeah. So this goes, as you see, from the inside out. So we can still form stars for roughly, you know, a, a hundred, for a few hundred million years in the central core. And, but we can keep forming stars for about one to two giga years in the outskirts. And so in our, this simple empirical model says that the star formation should switch off from the central part to the outskirts. And so the, the picture we kind of envision is that, you know, that you have this kind of bulge formation process, you know, that you have this kind of compaction phase that drafts a lot of gas into the central region. You blow up a lot of gas afterwards, and you have maybe some re-accreting gas, or maybe some leftover gas in the outskirts that has still some star formation outskirts that kind of slowly switches off. Now, the detailed physics, you know, this is what I've kind of just described here, um, is, is, is based on, on the simulations I've showed you before. But, you know, what is, for example, if an HEN or morphological quenching or simply a gas supply cutoff? So there are many other ideas on, on quenching. So what I will show you now is some indication that actually some HEN might be at work, you know, at, at helping switching off the star formation from the central part. And so because we have all this spectroscopy, what we did is we can decompose the H alpha emission line into a broad and a narrow component. Okay. And so what I show you here are, you know, um, six, six massive galaxies um, in our sample. So the left figure um, always shows you the H alpha in green, um, the, the blue shows you J um, band, and the, the red is showing you H band. And then the right part of the image shows you in green the narrow part of H alpha, and the contours are showing you the H alpha, the broad component. Okay? And so what you can see in most of the cases, or actually in all of the cases, is that you know, the central part has a very you know, strong contribution um, of the broad component to H alpha, whereas the narrow contribution is mainly coming from the outside. And so you can see this also here. These are the stacked spectra of the nuclei, so of the central two kiloparsecs, versus the, the disk, the, the thing in the outskirts. And so if we, if, we, if we stack the spectra, you can see that, the, you know, the, that there is a broader component underlying these emission lines, and the disk components are rather narrow. And so we can quantify this uh, a bit more, looking at the full width half maximum for the broad component. You can see that the lower mass galaxies, they seem to have, you know, kind of for the disk um, and the nucleus have roughly the same uh, full width half maximum of, of roughly 500 kilometers per second. But when you go to more massive si systems of the order of 10 to the 11 solar masses, so the galaxies that show this inside out quenching phenomena, those galaxies have an increased, um, you know, full width half maximum um, in the nucleus with respect to the disk. 
Also, when we look into N2 over H alpha as a ratio in the center versus the outskirts, we find an increase of N2 over H alpha. And so all these things together, you know, kind of pinpoint to, you know, time 2 H, um, to have 2 to HN being at work. But, you know, when we look at, for example, X-ray data and so on, these galaxies don't appear there. Okay, so they are not for sure very bright X-ray sources. Or when you look at their infrared colors, they are not having very strong, um, you know, any, any kind of indication of having very, very weird colors. Okay, so I think I, I should, you know, maybe just give you a final kind of um, overview about the last part. So when we think about, you know, what we have looked, what I show you here are the solar mass functions. And so the galaxies I have been looking at now is really kind of the massive end um, of star-forming galaxies at redshift of two. And as I mentioned before, it's because when you, all these galaxies are star-forming, we expect the mass function to look something like this at later epochs. But actually, you see that the knee of the mass functions remains roughly constant. So this is exactly the, the quenching effect that I told you before. These galaxies will switch off their star formation and will be added to the quiescent galaxy population that is significantly built up from redshift 2 to redshift 1. And so, you know, when we look at these galaxies, I told you before, is that, you know, they show a lot of rotations. There seems to be, you know, a lot of um, rotation ongoing. So, you know, the velocity V over sigma is roughly 5. Um, and, and they have already made a central dense component, and so it seems like they don't need to have, you know, a, lot, a big effect like a merger, for example, to take place to bring them down. They can basically just switch off their star formation rather smoothly and then be added to the quiescent galaxy population. And so when we look at the quiescent galaxy population at the later epoch, what we find is that indeed some of these objects, you know, that are massive at the of the one to two, are rotating. So there are the first measurements that show rotation in these systems. And you can see, you know, some, some kind of lensing constraints from, from these people here. Um, and so there is, there is an indication that indeed that probably these you know, rotating disks are still existing um, for some, some significant amount of time down, down to these redshifts. What happens then at the later epoch, this is, um, you know, it depends probably much on the environment and how much major mergers and minor mergers you will have. But this is, of course, you know, a whole story for itself, and I don't have, I think, time to go into that. So I will um, move over to some outlook. Um, this is, of course, a very biased outlook. Um, so still open questions that I'm very interested in addressing the next few years are about, you know, what physics um, sets really the limit or, you know, what kind of physics quenches the galaxies. Um, but especially when they reach a very high efficiency in converting baryons into stars. Then, you know, how, where does the diversity come from from star formation histories? I think this is a very interesting question. We'll learn much more with, with JWST. And then also, when, when and where do the first disk and bulges form? As I said, some of the galaxies of Redshift 2, they have already made their bulge component. And so the question is really, you know, when do we see the first bulges being formed? And so I think we have, you know, a very bright future in front of us, especially when, you know, when you think about JWST. I'm part of the, the GTO team, I'm also based here at the CFA. And so we will be really mapping out the you know, stellar mass structure um, for galaxies at redshifts above four. And so we will really learn about, a lot about you know, the first bulges from this kind of instrument. And I started a, a survey at the MMT to look in specifically the transition region between the star-forming galaxies and the quiescent galaxies, trying to understand a bit more um, you know, their ionization, um, ionization sources in these galaxies, HN versus star formation. And then on the other side, there's of course also illustrious um, simulations um, here done and numerical simulations that are, would be very interesting to look into and, and study a bit more um, the, the, the overall um, kind of formation of spherules in these simulations. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Yes. No. Um, and so we, what we do is we take in. I mean, so one thing is um, talking about. I mean, so first I focus on the massive systems, so above 10 to the 10 solar masses, and so those galaxies are usually they are well resolved, so we don't have to worry about this. The the ones that were dispersion dominated, um, they are really below 10 to the 10, so they are in the mass regime of 10 to the 9 to 10 to the 10, and so you know this is this is one way. But then also I look into, I mean, I, I did a forward modeling of, of the H alpha profiles to take into account um, the PSF of, of, of the IFU data. So I was taking care of that. 
as well as for the ages, the images. You know, the, the thing is, of course, even though we have a, an exquisite resolution of about the kiloparsec, you still need to make sure that, you know, that you measure the mass of in a kiloparsec in the right way. So you, you need to do some, some forward modeling of, of the profiles. Mm -hmm. So in your models, you, you, you don't have APN. Anymore. Yes. <laughs> Yes. Um, so how are you successfully able yes. to make galaxies that look like the galaxy? Yes. Well, so these are very different pieces of simulation. So there is um, so the, the, um, the Vila simulations I was referring to, um, those are really looking into the, into the star-forming galaxy population at high redshifts. And so these galaxies are, these, gal these simulations are just drawn to around to redshift one. And we are not really reproducing, you know, a large box like the Luster's TNG simulation. So we are not really making statements about the, you know, the, the quenched population, the galaxy population. Um, and this is just, you know, because we are looking really at the star formation process itself. And then when we look into the quenching process, we see that the galaxies are, you know, significantly reducing the star formation, but they, totally, they don't totally switch off the star formation rates. And so if you would run those simulations down to redshift zero, what will happen most probably is that they will be too massive. And so now we are starting to look into an HGN feedback implementation. The problem is just like, this is very ad hoc. You know, with the stellar feedback, we have kind of a good feeling of how much energy there is put in in which phase and so on. But with an, uh, with an HGN, it's much more difficult. And because, you know, there's even more separate physics that we don't resolve in, 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 you know, for such simulations. On the other hand, the illustrious TNG, of course, the, the, the thing is that, you know, that the smoothing scale there is of all, already of the order of a kiloparsec. And so, you know, these set simulations will never be able to really resolve the gas dynamics on the space resolved scale. So I'm looking into this a little bit now, but, um, you know, it, it will be very challenging for such simulations to really say something about, for example, the star formation rate profiles as well as stellar mass profiles. So are you sure, though, at, at C equals a few that the APN no. are not important? No, we are not sure. Okay. No, it's, it is an assumption in, in the model that we take. Um, mainly because we don't know how to implement, uh, you know, a, a very realistic HN feedback. And so you can think of this is like a model that, you know, neglects HN feedback and sees what the effect is. And as you see, it reproduces observations rather well. You know, when you think about the, the profiles themselves, uh, which is already astonishing. But I think where the, the simulations have a problem with is that the galaxies are, are probably too massive at lower redshifts then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 